We've been for the last three weeks uh, meditating on one thing, what the Lord has to speak to his church. I often prayed for, for years, I asked, Lord, why don't you appear and speak to me? Will you pray like that? A lot of people don't pray like that nowadays. Because, um, oh, we don't have, we don't need the appearance of the Lord anyhow. Um, is one. I prayed like that. If Jesus were to appear today, and what would he speak is the question. He would speak no different from what he spoke to the church, churches of the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, the Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, there are seven churches. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia and Laodicea. There are seven churches. To each one, the Lord is walking amongst them and he's seeing each one. You know, when we come to God's house, you might think, oh God, does God see my struggle? We think, if, does God know my thoughts? Does God know my fears? Does God know my, what I'm going through? I'll tell you, my dear brothers and sisters, when you come to God's house, the Lord knows every thought of yours. Shall we say amen? Every fear of yours, every anxiety of yours. He knows even before a thought comes to our mind. He knows it through and through. When we sit down, he knows it. When we get up, he knows it. And he's speaking to the church this word. He wants one thing. All the seven churches. He spoke seven different things about what they need to correct. But he spoke on one thing. That they need to live an overcoming life. A life that will please him. You and I, if that is not our aim, definitely you are on a wrong track. The right track for us is, I want to live a life, overcoming life that will please my Lord. Shall we say amen? May God give us that overcoming life and he will not help unless we really are serious about it and ask him. If we don't ask, we will not receive that kind of help. You know, he has separated us. He has saved us that we may be separate from the world. The point of salvation is that we may stay away from sin. That we may not play with the sin. Now let's come back here. Um, I want to emphasize, as I've been praying this uh, for the past week and then asking the Lord. Um, Lord, remind me one thing. You see, every time when the Lord speaks, the Lord speaks the, the truth and sometimes the truth hurts. We don't hear messages like what he spoke in the Gospels. If you see what Jesus spoke, we don't, we don't want to hear that kind of thing. Jesus is always harsh. We want a softer and nicer messages. You know, what a Lord, I always, Lord, give me a softer and nicer message. The Lord says, that is not the true message. You, you shall preach only the word that I give you. So, Lord, I surrender myself. I don't want to preach anything unless the Lord says, share this. I don't want to make up any story of my own, which we can, obviously, we can hear, listen, Lord, all kinds of stories and all kinds of unnecessary things from the, you know, taking from, even taking from the scripture, we can take, teach what God doesn't want us to hear. But what the Lord wants us to hear today, um, when, you know, the Lord uh, opened my eyes to see one thing. You can have tasty food. How many of us like tasty food? Yes? All of us like tasty food. If we eat tasty food, um, everybody wants tasty food, but the thing is, a lot of people who want tasty food never think about, is there really any nutritious value in it? It seems one doctor said like this, if it is good for your lip, it is bad for your hip, he said. <laughs> any food that is good for your lip is bad for your hip, he said. You know, think about the fried food. Uh, a lot of people, everybody likes fried food, right? Fried food really tastes good, yes, but it has zero nutritional value. It says when you really fry it in the oil, it is, nutrition is gone. We want good taste, but we do, are not looking for nutritional value. But it may, when, it, when you eat something which is healthy, it may not really taste that good. But sure, it will give you nutritious value. So we should not look for what is good for listening. When the Lord speaks, he never speaks to tickle our intellect nor our mind or ear, even though we want something like a, a fun, a comedy thing. When Jesus spoke, he never spoke like that. He was very serious. He spoke the matters of truth and people were offended. People were offended. Some disciples left him. 
When some disciples leave him, Lord Jesus turns to his own disciples, the twelve of them, and says, Will you leave too? You know what Peter said? Where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Even those, the words of Lord Jesus may sound harsh, but they will give life to our bodies. You know, we want God to tell us the truth, truth about our own lives, so that we will receive life and life eternal. Do you want to say amen? We don't want to be like if it's like a, a patient going to a doctor and asking, don't tell me the bad news, give me the good news. Next time, every, every time, any, any time you go to a doctor, tell that to a doctor and see. Doctor, I don't want to hear God, bad news. Tell me only good news. If you have bad news, keep it to yourself. <laughs> that won't fly. The doctor will say, no, I have to tell you what, is it, what the situation is so that we may fix the issue. If we, that's what the truth of the Lord is. When Jesus speaks, he speaks about the truth, what we need to hear. And not only just he speaks and goes away, but he gives the fix to change our lives. May the Lord give us that kind of an overcoming life. What is this overcoming life that the Lord is talking about? He is talking to the church of Pergamum. I want you to look at the book of Revelation chapter 2. Book of Revelation chapter 2. We have, we have also uh, we have meditated on this last uh, Sunday too. But I want to get into um, one particular aspect of it. Let me read a few words so that you can get to the context and, and listen. Revelation chapter 2. The angel of the church in Pergamum write, the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you dwell and where Satan's throne is. You hold fast to my name and you did not deny my faith in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. You have there who hold to the teaching of Balaam. Who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. So that they might eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. I've explained the story of that last week. Listen carefully please. The story uh, goes up about Balaam. What is the teaching of Balaam? Israelites have left Egypt. The Israelites are God's chosen people and they dwell in Egypt. And then God redeems them. By, by the blood of the lamb and they come out of Egypt and they are going into the promised land, the land that God has promised. While they are while they're, while they're going, the Bible says there are about 600,000 men, 6 lakhs, only men. Even if you had just a, a, a one woman, um, then you can say more than 1.2 million people. It's a more than a million people they are passing and they are going. And the king Balak is really scared. You know what he says? I want them to be cursed. I want them to be destroyed. So he's calling a prophet called Balaam to come and curse them. Prophet Balaam now, the people of Balak come um, to Balaam. And then Balaam says, let me pray first. We should learn that important principle. Before you start doing anything, unless you see God's will, our life will be a failure. Shall we say amen? We need to learn that. Before you take up anything, first seek to do the will of God. You know why? He that does the will of God will abide forever. And anything that you do outside the will of God will perish, will not be counted before God. One day we'll stand before the Lord. The Lord will look at whether you have done His will. Because some st one statement that the Lord makes in Matthew 7, um, verse 21, the Lord says, Not everyone who calls Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father. So if you do the will of God, if you are a child of God, will of God is not an option for you. A lot of people will only seek the will of God, you know, in matters of job, in matters about, you know, marriage, in the matters of this, and matters of important decision making. They don't understand, Lord, I want to do your will today. They don't, they don't pray, they don't have the heart like that. They don't understand that the will of God is not an option for a believer, for a Christian. Will of God, you have, we all have to be in the will of God. Our families, our children should walk in the will of God if we miss that. Okay, you are just missing the God's best, but you have some God's um, least, you might think. No, if you are a child of God, you should do the will of God. There is no if, there is no second option. Because a lot of people may, um, disagree that and says, okay, we have questions about that. Matthew chapter 7, I want you to see these words, please. Matthew chapter 7. 
Um, as I read this verse, then we'll, we'll go back in the, to book of Revelation chapter 2. Verse 21, Matthew 7, 21, the word of God says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Who enters the kingdom of heaven? Many times I've shared with you who enters the kingdom of heaven. There are uh, many, many truths about the kingdom of God we study in the Bible studies um, that we have learned who will enter and who will not enter. The Lord says, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, but the one who does the will of God. So may the Lord help us to do the will of God. Now listen to the story, please. Now the, the messengers of Balak, the king, come to Balaam. And they ask Balaam, the king is calling you so that you could curse these people. Balaam says, let me pray first. If God tells me to go, I'll go. So Balaam starts praying. When he starts praying, the Lord tells him, do not go. When the Lord says, do not go, he comes and tells these people, I'm not coming, God is not permitting me to come. They go back and tell the king, the prophet is not coming to do what you are saying, to curse that people. So what the king does is, king gives more money to these messengers. They go and the prophet sees the money. Okay, should the prophet say, I'm not coming? Or should he say, I'm praying again, I will pray again? Are you with me? Are you asleep? The prophet should say, I've already prayed. The Lord said, no, I'm not coming. But he saw more gifts and money. He says, let me pray again. You see the point? A person's perspective will change based on money and gift. Any man who is tending towards money is not a true servant of God. Mark these words, please. A person should not change based on the money at all. A man's character should never change based on the circumstances, not the money. May you and I be like that. Shall we say amen? Who will not change based on circumstance. Who will not change because of any other influence. We want to do the perfect will of God. That man goes and prays. The Lord says, you go but I tell you. But I tell you you'll only speak the words that I give you. He's going, he's sitting on a donkey. He's, he's going on a donkey. And this man, this prophet is not a, some ordinary prophet. Numbers 24, 7, 17, the, the prophet himself says, I see, he's a man who sees visions with open eyes. You know, prophets and uh, all these seers, they were called in the Old Testament as a seers. They will see visions with eyes closed and while they were sleeping, while they were praying, while they were, you know, but he sees visions with eyes open. He says, I see a star coming out of Jacob. He sees the land of Israel, the people of Israel and says, I see a star coming out of Jacob. He's prophesying about Jesus Christ. But you know what? He has, had, he has those visions, but his life, his heart is not right with God. That man is going on a donkey. While he's going on a donkey, there is an angel, the angel of the Lord standing with the sword. The man who sees visions with open eyes, not able to see the angel of the Lord. See, why, I was asking the Lord, 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 why did you reveal yourself to this church as the one who has the two-edged sword? You see, anyone who has the teaching or walk in the ways of Balaam will meet the person with God with a two-edged sword. Remember this, please. Because God met Balaam with a two-edged sword. Um, thank you. So, the donkey sees that. Donkey sees the angel with a two-edged sword. You know what donkey does? Donkey takes the prophet and goes, hits him to the wall. And then the prophet gets angry. Balaam gets angry. And he starts beating the donkey. When he starts beating the donkey, the donkey starts speaking. You know what does the donkey say? Why are you beating? I saved your life from the angel who is about to kill you. A lot of people say, oh, I don't believe Bible because it has all kinds of stories. Like a fish swallowing a man. Like a donkey talking. Probably Hollywood caught up to it. We see Hollywood, all kinds of cartoon network, cats talking, dogs talking English. Uh, <laughs> maybe somebody said they got it from the donkey speaking dialogue. Yes, God can open the mouth of any creature to speak. Donkey spoke to Balaam. I saved your life, why are you beating me? He goes there. Instead of cursing the people, he blesses them. Balak is angry with Balaam. He says, what is this? I call you to curse the people. Now, here is the main lesson we need to uh, understand, please. You know what Balaam said? I cannot curse the people whom you blessed. 
whom God has blessed. I'll tell you, nobody can do any damage to you. No scheme of man, no power of hell can ever pluck us from his hand. Shall we say amen? The devil can do nothing to you. No man can do anything to you. But, come back to Revelation chapter 2. He says, you yourself can bring destruction to you. So how can we... Oh, you mean I can bring destruction to myself? How can I bring destruction to myself? I know um, Revelation 2.14. I have a few things against you. That you have some who hold the teaching of Balaam. Who taught Balak. You know what Balaam taught? Balaam taught Balak to do something. You know, you cannot destroy these people. But you can do one thing. You can get their own God who protects them to destroy them. He says, put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel. What is a stumbling block? They should eat the food sacrificed to the idols, practice sexual immorality. Listen carefully, please. Our God is there to protect us. Satan gives a testimony before God about Job. Here is a man whom you put a fence around him, his family, and everything that he has. I cannot touch him. So devil cannot touch a person whom God puts offense. But when a person is now not realizing that he can invite trouble for himself. Satan cannot do. A lot of people um, I know, in one, one, one small village, um, a pastor goes into a small village. When a pastor goes into a small village, listen to this. Uh, this is not a made up story though. This is a real story that happened in India in the state of Karnataka. Uh, when a pastor goes into a small village, those villagers do not like um, do not like this pastor to come and start a church. You know what they did? We want to do some uh, black magic on him. We want to do some witchcraft on him. You know, witchcraft is real. Don't just write it off. Um, black magic is real because the powers of darkness. You know, the evil has power, real power, that can even kill people, that can destroy people. So a lot of people say, oh, we don't believe in black magic, we don't believe in the demons, they, are all, they don't exist. No, they exist. The powers of darkness are real and they are powerful. But if you have Christ in you, he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. Do you want to say amen? You know, he, that, that, that man who was doing, in the middle of the night, he, he sat on a dead body and he's doing the, um, the, whatever the black magic routine is. He's doing the black magic routine. He's calling the demons and says, why don't you go attack that pastor? He's calling the big demons that he knows. And then the demon is saying, I cannot go near him. His God is a real God. What do you mean? Are you not a God? That you are saying that he is God? And then are you a false God? He said, no, no, we are not really gods. We are fallen angels. We are the demonic forces. He is a real God. If we go there, something happens to us. We get burnt. The demon is speaking, the one who is doing a witchcraft. If we go close to him, we get burnt. We see a wall of fire around his house. We can't come closer to him. It is like fire, fire, fire. If you've seen any demonic possession, um, here yeah, then um, servants of God driving out demons in India, you know, the demons will say, there is fire, I, can, I want to run away from here. There is fire. There will be in a church meeting like this or in a prayer meeting. They see the fire of God. They want to run away. You see, for, for an evil spirit, you can see the fire of God that's on a person. And it is like they're tormenting. You know, the demon possessed person, when you saw Lord Jesus, you know, Luke chapter 8, verse um, 31, that man said to Jesus, why did you come to torment us? How can Jesus torment uh, a demon possessed person? Demons can see what Jesus can do. Do not bind us in the abyss. You know, Jesus has authority. The name of Jesus has authority to bind these demons into abyss. That they cannot move. But the demons are asking, you know, let us go into pigs. You see, evil is real. Evil can see that. Now, now that's not the uh, point of the story. But come back to Luke, um, uh, point of the message. But come back to Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. Revelation 2, 14. There is an offender... And there is an offended. If you want to live an overcoming life, we should put no stumbling block before others. Lord, make my life like that. 
There are, I want to talk about these two things. One is the offender, and second is the offended. There are a lot of Christians who offend others. You know, why do we offend others? Because they want to do something out of their carnal heart. And that's why they offend others. What happens? What's so big deal? He's also another believer. If I put a stumbling block before others, what will happen? My dear brothers and sisters, watch your words. Use your words to bless people, not curse people. Amen? Use your words to build up people, not to destroy people. Use your attitude, your prayer life to bless and build lives and build families, not to destroy them. Our life should be a blessing to thousands of people, not be a problem. See, there will be offenders. The problem with offenders, you know, the, the greatest uh, trouble, um, Jesus spoke, when Jesus speaks, um, he speaks the truth and then that offends people. And he says, if somebody stumbles, turn with me, Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18, here are some harsh words, not my words, but these are words of Lord Jesus. Um, the reason why I'm telling you is this, that our life, that we may never become offenders. That we don't put a stumbling block before others. That when we stand before God, may the Lord may not say about us, hey, you, because of your words, because of your lifestyle, many people stumbled. Matthew chapter 18. Um, he's talking about the kingdom of God. Verse 3 onwards, verse 3 to 6. Let me read it, please. Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will not, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like a child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to, one translation says, stumble. Other translation says, sin. It is better for him to have a millstone tied around his neck and be thrown into the depth of the sea. What a word, even our mind, if you imagine that, tears will come to you. Or even, um, Lord, I don't, I don't want to even listen to this kind of thing. If, some, if, you, if a person causes another person, if he causes a childlike faith, if a person, you know, a, a little child, or the one who just came to Christ, to sin, it is better for that person to have a millstone tied around his neck, be thrown into the depths of the sea, that that person may not come back. Why does Jesus speak like this? Because he knows what will happen for those who offend others. Lord, give me a life that will not offend, put us, become a stumbling block. I want to talk about the, that we may be careful about our own lives. Turn with me, please. First Corinthians. First Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, and then... Verse 32, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Let me read this and then um, there in the context, he's saying, um, he's talking about the, when we come to the presence of God, he's talking about the food sacrifice to the idols and then the demonic thing and then the, the table of the Lord in the whole context. He says, Verse 31, 32, 33. Let me read 31. So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. In everything, our goal is this. If you go for a picnic barbecue, you, you play, you fellowship, you eat, you go out for a party. If the glory of God, if you do anything that will bring, that will not bring glory of God, it will become a sin for a believer. Because definition of sin is very broad in the scripture. If you don't do anything for the glory of God, that can become sin. Verse 32. Give no offense to Jews or Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything that I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that many, that they may be saved. Then he says, um, now there is a chapter division there in your Bible that was not there in the original. Be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. We should all be able to say, you know, a lot of people are saying, hey, don't look at me, look at Christ nowadays. That is one type of a message. Don't look at my life, my life is not authentic. You know, I falter again and again and again, I continue the same thing, look at Jesus. But the Lord said, you know, I want you to think about this. Christian life is not just worshiping Christ. When Jesus said a word, follow me, 
You know, he did not just say, admire me, worship me. He said, follow me. He is expecting us to be followers of him, meaning doing what he does. And also, Apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. We all should be able to say, follow me as I follow Christ. When he was able to say that is this. Every day, his strife is, Lord, my life is without offense. I want to keep, I don't want to be a stumbling block before anybody. Look at what verse 32 says. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. What is the application? My dear brothers and sisters, in what you eat, we should be blameless. In what you speak, you should be blameless. And then our, you know, what we wear, what we do, our, our habits, our lifestyle should be without, that should not hinder others. First Corinthians chapter 8, quickly please. Chapter 8 and verse 13. Here he's talking about, uh, probably this is this context we may not experience much, but First Corinthians chapter 8 verse 13. Um, verse 11, 12, 13, let me read in the context so that you'll understand. So by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed. The brother, brother for whom to whom, for whom Christ died, thus sinning against your brother and wounding their conscience. You know, when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes your brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Now the question there is, somebody who doesn't eat meat is with you and you, are, you have freedom to eat meat. And you have freedom to eat meat and then somebody just came to Christ and they have... Um, he's just saved and he doesn't eat meat. When you meet that kind of a brother, better not eat meat. You know why? Oh, then should we become people pleasers? He's not talking about that we should become people pleasers. Hey, think about others' conscience. I have a conscience and they have a conscience. Conscience is manasakshi, manalona sakshi. He is the, the witness we have within ourselves is the conscience. We do, you know, if you do anything, please do not do anything against conscience. This year is the, uh, what is called the 500th year anniversary of Reformation. Martin Luther um, uh, rebelled against or uh, stood against the Pope of Roman Catholicism. You know, when uh, Pope asked Martin Luther, why don't you recant the words that you spoke? He wrote, nine, he wrote 95 points on a letter that called us commonly known as 95 Thesis. He went to a church in Wittenberg and then he nailed those 95 points to the church door. That is where the, that was the announcement board. He wrote it there, he put it in the bulletin board. It got to the Pope notice and, and then Martin Luther says these words, I cannot recant unless I am convinced by the scripture and I cannot go against my conscience, he says. Two things. First thing is I have to be convinced by scriptures. Scripture is very plain and clear to tell us what we should do and what we should not do. And then I cannot go against my conscience. My dear brothers and sisters, if there's anybody who doesn't eat meat and if you're going to meet that person who just came to Christ, for his sake, don't eat meat that day. You know why? We are really honoring his you know, he just came to Christ and then his conscience, if his conscience is defiled, he says, it will become a sin for you. Because he is a brother for whom Christ died. He doesn't have the same kind of understanding of the scripture like you have. Or he does, he, your maturity level is high and his maturity, he just came to Christ. You, you know, in, in Christianity too, there are little children, meaning who just came to Christ, who received the forgiveness of sin. You know, there are youth. The youth are those who fought against the evil and they are overcomers. And then there are fathers who are bringing others to Christ. First Corinthians, uh, First John chapter 2 explains these stages. You know, we need to identify some who are baby Christians who just came. You know, they, they are milk may be their portion. You better not use your freedom to trouble them. My dear brothers and sisters, don't become a stumbling block for others. Let not our behavior. Romans chapter 2, turn with me. Here is a word um, Paul was writing to the church of Rome and he says, hey, watch your behavior. Many times what happens is because of our behavior, Romans chapter 2, you know, the name of God is blasphemed, verse 24, 23 and 24. You boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. If you know the word of God, you know how you dishonor God? By breaking the word of God. 
Verse 24 says, For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. This is quoting Isaiah chapter 52, an Old Testament verse. Many a times Christians' behavior will become a hindrance for others. Lord, help me never to be like that. To a non-Christian and also to a Christian and to one who is seeking to become a Christian. Let me tell you a story of, you know, you all know, if you have ever seen, um, you know, uh, Gandhi's uh, uh, a movie about Gandhi or read the book of, uh, or autobiography of Gandhi. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, uh, he, he, was, he was reading New Testament. He was so attracted by the words of Lord Jesus. In his autobiography, he says, the words of Jesus speak to my heart. But when he went to a church, they would not allow him to come to the church because of his color. You see there? He was discriminated because of his color. And another thing, he asked the people who are witnessing to um, uh, Gandhi, you know, Jesus died for your sin. He, he read the New Testament. You know, Gandhi asked one question to the Christians. Is your Christ able to set me free from sin? You know what the pathetic answer that our folks gave is this. He will forgive you of your sins, but you can never be set free of your sin. We'll go repeat the same sin, come back, repeat the same sin, come back. And then he says, if I, if I can be in that cycle of sin and never be set free, I don't want that kind of a savior. You see, they only preached about the forgiveness of sin, the first step. They did not talk about it. The sun shall set you free. You are free from sin. They never talk about the second part of it. And then you receive the spirit of God who will give you victory over sin. They never talked about the full gospel. They did not talk about the full truth. They only talk about, oh, you'll receive forgiveness, but you'll never be set free. You see the point? He said, I don't want that kind of a savior. See, when, when Gandhi stands before God, would not Gandhi have had an opportunity to listen to the gospel? He read the New Testament. Many a times it is the Christians who are a hindrance for another person to become, come to Christ. Lord, let me not live that kind of a lifestyle. Lord, help me to change from this day. Let me change my words my lifestyle, that we may not become offenders because to offend others. Um, you know, what will, what will affect the eternity of another person? What Balaam taught Balak. Balaam said, I cannot curse them, but you can do one thing. Numbers chapter 31, Numbers chapter 31 and verse 16. You can do one thing, Mr. Balak. You know, I cannot, you cannot destroy them, but their God can destroy them. I will tell you the secret. My dear brothers and sisters, learn this and then your life will, you will be an overcomer. You will be so blessed that your life will, when you stand before God, that you will live a blameless life. Numbers 31, 16. The, Behold these on Balaam's advice caused the people of Israel to act treacherously against the Lord in the incident of Peor. So the plague came among the congregation of the Lord. Oh, you might say this is all the Old Testament. God doesn't, uh, um, you know, punish his own people. That was Old Testament, you might think. I'll tell you this, sin is so seriously. If a Christian, if a believer, those who believe in Christ continue sinning, there is terrible consequence. You know, that's what, what we read before the table, 1 Corinthians 11. He says, let a person examine himself and take part in the table. That is why many of you are weak, many of you are ill, and some are fallen asleep, meaning some of you are dead. Death can even come to a believer when he takes sin lightly. The advice of Balaam to Balak is this. You can do nothing to them. I can do nothing to them. Nobody can do anything to them, but their own behavior, if they go away from the word of God, if they go away from the ways of God, if they do not keep their life pure and holy, destruction, their own God, will start giving you them trouble. Thousands of people of Israel died. Listen carefully, please. Satan is called the greatest tempter. In the Garden of Eden, you know when Satan attacks you, Oh, you might think the Satan would come. He doesn't come with a, you know, Onida TV advertisement. Anybody remember Onida TV advertisement in India? A bald head man with a two, um, you know, with a big tail for the Satan. He comes with a pitchfork. Satan doesn't come like that, my dear brothers and sisters. 
Satan doesn't come like that. He came with soft words. I'll tell you, the devil now is um, using pulpits to share his teaching. Many, many places to take people away from God. He just said, did God really tell you? He will question the very word of God. That's why if somebody preaches, open this and read it. If you don't have this open, they can tell you their own logic and twist your mind with their logic. Logic is not what we should be convinced by logic. It should be convinced by the word of God. Shall we say amen? He said, did God really say that? If you eat this fruit, you're not going to die, he said. And Eve ate that fruit. And then she sinned against God. You know what, what was the consequence of that? The day you shall eat that fruit, you shall surely die. God had uninterrupted communion with Adam and Eve till they sinned. The very God who created the garden and put them there had daily fellowship with God. Same God drove them out. We need to understand the seriousness of sin. That is what overcoming life is. The stumbler, the greatest tempter, he is called the deceiver of the whole world. He is called the God of the world with a smaller g. He is called the prince of the power of the air. When he comes, he does one thing. He wants you to go away from the ways of God, from the word of God, from the purity of God. He wants you to play with sin. That's what he does. Same devil came to Lord Jesus. Again, he did not come like that only the TV commercial. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't come like a scary guy. He came and gave an advice to Jesus. Are you hungry? You're fasting, right? Look at these stones. Why don't you do a miracle? Turn these stones into bread and eat. The Lord said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the living God. We need to learn and say, my way, you know, you may not like it or devil, or it may be against the world, but I will not live because of what the world says, not because of what I eat, but because of the word of God. Shall we say amen? Unless we learn that, you become an offender, you become a stumbling block of others. Ma Matthew chapter 16. How, how can people become stumbling blocks? Matthew chapter 16. You know, Jesus had this disciple, this wonderful disciple who wants to live for the Lord, who has a zeal, but he did not have the discernment before that. He had the zeal to live for God, but he did not, and it was not spiritual, nor he understood the ways of God fully. Uh, Matthew chapter uh, 16, when you come here, <coughs> verse 20. Let me read from 21. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed on the third day raised. Peter looked at him. Uh, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter is rebuking Lord Jesus. Think about here. A disciple is telling the master what to do. You know, the king of kings and lord of lords. The, the Lord wants to say, I'm going to die on the cross and I'm going to raise on the third day. His own disciple takes Jesus Christ aside and says, no, 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 that you cannot die like this. You know what the Lord said? He says, far be it from you, Lord, this has never happened to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, verse 23, he turned and said to Peter, get me behind Satan. You are a hindrance for me, for you are setting your mind on, you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Anyone who sits, sets his mind on the things of man, not on the things of God. Jesus said, you are a hindrance for me. He became a stumbling, but the Lord said, no, I cannot take that. I cannot take your advice. Because it's not coming from God, it's coming from man. May the Lord give you discernment. Give me discernment. Every day we need to have that discernment. If you get an idea, if somebody gives you an idea, if somebody tells you something, is this from God or is this not from God, we should be able to discern. If you don't have that discernment, if you don't have that discernment, if you don't have that devil will use good ideas, good logic, just like he came to Jesus and said, you're hungry, right? Eat. And do this miracle for yourself. Oh, you said it is written. You know, I'm telling you, jump from here. It's also written that the angels will hold you. 
He quotes Psalm 81. Devil can quote the Bible very well. You should know in what context is he quoting. Is he taking it out of context? Is he taking this verse and applying it everywhere? That's what the devil does. Take one verse, apply it everywhere. I says because it said there. Why did he do it? What is the context? Why did he say? What does it mean? That's a promise there. That's it. It doesn't mean that it's applicable in every context. He says, no Lord, you're not going to die on the cross. Peter said that to Lord Jesus. The Lord said, you're a hindrance to me. Get thee behind me, Satan. One minute, a few minutes before, you know, when Peter said, you are the son of the living God, the Lord said, you know, Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father has given it. Even you may have revelation of God. I'll tell you this. A lot of people who have good revelation of God, because their heart is not steadfast to do what is right, they can become agents of the evil one. Just like the Balaam. You know, did, did not Balaam have visions? Did, did Balaam have visions? Yes or no? Yes. Does Balaam know God? Yes. But if you, if you want to know what happened to Balaam, read the book of Joshua. If you read the last verses, Israelites killed Balaam. You know that? If you ever think what would happen to Balaam, you know the same prophet who said, I cannot curse these people, but I'll tell you a way that you can be blessed because he took the money from them. He took money from Balak, he wanted to do some favor to him. You want the God's people to be destroyed, I'll tell you a technique. I'll tell you. Satan is getting into God's people's life to destroy them. Satan is getting into churches to destroy churches. Satan is getting into how nice good teaching is this. If you sin is okay. You can play with it, come back, ask for forgiveness and take part. They don't know that they are destroying their own soul. They don't know the presence of God is not leading them. They don't know that no longer they, you know, they, are, they are enraging the spirit of grace. Not only they are grieving the Holy Spirit, not only they are quenching the Holy Spirit, they are enraging the Spirit of Grace, says Hebrews chapter 10, 28. You know, enraging the Spirit of Grace. A lot of people say, oh, blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not possible for Christians. That's only human speculation. Jesus said, you know, anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. If it's forgiven for the Father, yes, if you speak against the Father, the Lord will forgive. If you speak against Lord Jesus, it will be forgiven. Nowadays, it is a fun for people to you know, talk against the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you, those are words of Lord Jesus. Be very careful when you talk about the Holy Spirit, God, or the works of the Holy Spirit. You don't know whether somebody is doing some miracle because they're filled with the Spirit of God or, or it's a demonic power. You better be quiet. But if God gives you discernment, then we speak. If God doesn't, you know, God does not give you the clear direction, don't blaspheme against the Holy Spirit because that will become a hindrance for others to seek Christ. And the Christians, a lot of times, even Christian preachers can become hindrance, a stumbling block for others. Lord, may my life never become a stumbling block. Help me. Romans chapter 14. I'll close quickly as we, um, when we take part of the table. But may the Lord help us to have an overcoming life. You know, you'll not have an overcoming life if you just keep on taking your life or your relationship with Christ lightly. Romans 14, 13. Another way um, of becoming a stumbling block in others' life. You know, I've said about, the, you know, what you do, what you speak, what you eat can become a hindrance, stumbling blocks. Second way people stumble is this, they put the minds on the things of man, not on the things of will of God. If you seek the will of God all the time, you will not be an offender. Here, another way you can become an offender of others. Romans chapter 14 and verse 13, the word of God says like this, Therefore let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. I know I'm persevering in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean by itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it is unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you're no longer walking in love, but what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not, for the, uh, do not let what you regard as good to be spoken as evil. For the kingdom of God is not about the matter of eating or drinking, but about righteousness 
peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God, God's work is nothing to do with anything external. What it about? The kingdom of God is a matter of righteousness, you being right with God. The kingdom of God is all about receiving a peace from heaven. I heard a non-Christian man yesterday um, who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. He said, oh, I don't have a problem coming to a church, but you know, I like one thing about uh, Jesus. I like one thing about Christians is this. They have the peace of God. In every situation, I was, I was shocked to listen. Wow, this man is making a statement. He doesn't know Christ, but he says he has seen something that the peace of God is in those lives of people who have Christ in them. He said, you know, then I said, you know, for the sake of, for the sake of peace, you should seek, seek Jesus, I told him. A non-Christian man, a Sindhi man said that. You know, he said, I see my own uh, nephews have become Christians. I see the, the lot of peace in their life. For everything they pray and seek God. And it seems God becomes real for them every day. And God, and they have a peace of God. They'll overcome um, everything because they have the peace of God. You see, that is the joy. That is the peace. Um, that we should have a testimony. Romans 14, 13 says like this. Do not pass judgment on others. You know why we become, become stumbling block on others? Because Christians pass judgment on one another. If you see a young believer, you know, always do not pass judgment. What is judgment? Because you did this, this will happen to you. That is judgment. You can discern something. Discernment is not judgment. Judgment is saying, Nik baga indi, ilage jarga. That is judgment. You see, we should not have that kind of an attitude for others. Don't pass judgment. Oh, this fellow doesn't know this, this fellow doesn't know. Oh, he's doing this, the consequence is this. Who are we to pass a judgment? You know, Apostle Paul says that don't pass judgment until Christ comes. He, when he comes, he will just go and judge everyone. So, brothers and sisters, even Christians, don't judge another one. Don't become a judge. You know, when you become a judge, you take the place of God. That is the most dangerous thing. Jesus is the one who is going to judge everyone. Don't judge your spouse. Don't judge your children. Don't judge your... You can discern. You can share with love, with, with concern. Something. That's not become judgment. That becomes concern. You know, judge is the one who sits on a judgment seat and says, because you did this, this will happen to you without any affection or a concern. But a brother or a friend or a father will always have a concern. You are going astray. I discern this. Please don't do this. That is love. So if you love, you will not put a stumbling block. How will you not become a stumbling block before others? Learn to love others. Love covers offenses. Even if somebody sins, instead of judging them, love them. Love will cover a multitude of sins for 1 Peter chapter 4. Proverbs says that time and again. Lord, help me never to become a stumbling block. The greatest, defense, the greatest problem is this. Others' people's lives are destroyed by the advice you give, by the words you speak, by the attitude you have, by the lifestyle you have. That's a dangerous thing. May the Lord help us not to become you know, offenders, that we may not become stumbling blocks to others. You know, that should be our prayer. I want to read this last verse, Second Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 3. Here about talking about ministry. Paul is talking about his own ministry. That he took measures in his own ministry that he would not become, his ministry may be without blame. You know, Christians should strive for this. Lord, I want to live a blameless life. Second Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians is a letter where, when the Corinthian church challenged, who is Paul that he is taking a, you know, uh, upon himself a lot? Just the situation like Moses came. You know, in our Bible studies, we've been discussing about the situation of Moses. You know, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. When we were talking about meekness, what is meekness? We talked about Moses. When people rebelled, rebelled against Moses, Moses did not fight with them. You see, what a life without offense. He did not fight with them. When Korah and his whole group rebels against Moses, he fell, fell down and says, please brothers, I did not take up this upon myself. You know, 250 of them challenges one man. You have taken too much on yourself. 
Did only God speak to you? Can God, God use any one of us? Moses falls down and says, please, I didn't take this upon myself. It is God who gave me this opportunity. We should have that kind of an attitude. That kind of, now the same situation like, like Moses, Paul is. The church of Corinth is challenging. Who is Moses? Or who is Paul? To, to write such a harsh words. Who is he? He'd say, you know, when he's personally, he talks softly, but when he writes, he writes very harsh. That's their charge, that those words are not mine. They are in 2 Corinthians 10. But 2 Corinthians 6, I want you to look at what the word of God says. Um, 6 3, he says, We put no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in affliction, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hungers, purity, knowledge, you know, by purity, by knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit's genuine love, truthful speech, power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. Through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true. Unknown and yet well known. As dying, behold, we live. In, in speaking all this, you know, you know what he says, verse 11, I want you to look at verse 11. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In turn, what in your hearts also. Come back to verse 3. He says, we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no, found, no fault may be found with our ministry. Whatever we do for God, may the Lord may not find any fault in our lives. Shall we say amen? Our ministry may be blameless. Our service to God may be blameless. If you do anything for the sake of God, don't do it for your personal benefit. Don't do it for your personal name. Don't do it to hurt others. Don't do it to, you know, may the Lord give us a blameless ministry. That should be our focus. If, you, if that's your focus, if that is what you're striving for, you know, God is able to keep us. It's, it's not the question that God is not able to keep us. It is mostly we who stray from that purpose. I will read this verse and close. Letter to Jude, the, um, the benediction. The benediction of um, letter to Jude, the last verse, big of revelation, is a letter to Jude. Now if, you're, if you have a lot of offenses against you, there's offending, you know, entrust yourself that every temptation you'll be able to overcome. Verse 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from some translations is falling, some says stumbling. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory and great joy. To the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, authority before all times, now and forever. It is he who is able to keep us blameless. It is he who is able to keep us from falling or stumbling. There are many places you can fall. There are many opportunities you can fall. But if you entrust yourself to God, he'll keep you. If you don't entrust yourself to God, you will not in, uh, experience God's keeping power. It is not that he is not capable. It is we who go away from him. He is all capable. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, when we read the revelation of God, the book of the scripture of God, God is always able to keep his people. There is no doubt about it. He gives you eternal salvation if you obey, says Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. If you come and obey him, your salvation is eternal. It can never be taken away from you. But that is very much clearly saying, if you obey there. He is able. He will keep you forever and ever. He will give you eternal life. You will be with him forever and ever. Your life, that you should be faithful. It is not a question about he can secure us for eternity. It is not a question about eternal security. It is our question about our daily faithfulness. He is able to keep us eternally secure. But it is our faithfulness which entrusting yourself. Lord, I don't want to be a stumbling block for my wife, for my husband, for my child, for my friend, for my brother. Let my words be without offense. Let my life be without offense. God wants us to be overcomers. 
the entire church is going in the way of Balaam. For those who are going in the way of Balaam. You know way of Balaam? Who stood in the way of Balaam? The angel of the Lord with a double-edged sword. It says Revelation chapter 2. I was reading Pergamum and says, Lord, why did you reveal yourself as a, the one who has the two-edged sword? And then he says, if you do not repent, I will come to you and I will uh, fight with you, make war with you with the sword in my mouth, he speaks. Lord, why are you speaking these kind of harsh words to church? He says, he says, that's a reality. Shall we bow our heads? Check whether if, if you have a lifestyle that will offend others.